everyone and welcome to Polina's Pages. Today we're finally talking about volume 2 of The Second Sex. Finally, because it's been literally 6 months since I promised to do part 2. Check out my video on part 1. I do apologize for the delay, but here it is, so let's dive straight in. Okay, so this time the introduction was pretty brief and I I hope that you did rewatch the video on part 1, but just in case, the key message of Beauvoir's work is that a woman is not born a woman, she becomes a woman. What Beauvoir claims in the introduction is that first of all she's happy because women are starting to assert their individuality and overthrow the myth of femininity. But even as women are slowly starting to dismantle these prejudices, the success does not come easily. Beauvoir comments that because women are brought up by women, their destiny is raised to be marriage. Their expected path in life is marriage, all that anyone expects from them is marriage and marriage subordinates them to men. And this is the key focus of volume 2, the difference in how marriage treats both sexes, the difference in how we see men react to marriage and how we see women react to marriage. She states that in this volume she will attempt to describe how women become women, so her previous claim from part 1, her most famous claim, and she talks about women as heirs to a weighty past, striving to forge a new future. And I think it's interesting to note as well that when she talks about women, she specifically says women are in the present state of education and customs. So she doesn't aim to describe ex eternal truth or find some like genius new revelation that generalizes all women. Instead she comments on how it is right now. And I think for a sociological work, this is a very important approach to take and shows love for knowledge and truth as it will be, an objective look at the info you have now. In part 1, Beauvoir analyzes how the different sexes are treated throughout childhood and specifically growing up. In the second volume, there is much more references to fiction and to like psychoanalytical writing and there's just a lot of references in general, so even if you don't necessarily agree with the work, I think that this is a very worthwhile read purely to see not only how well Beauvoir Beauvoir integrates the work, but also just for the general knowledge. And Beauvoir disagrees with Freud that it is the absence of a male sexual organ that makes a woman behave the way that a woman behaves. Instead, she believes that it is through socialization that we come to acquire the values that certain genders have. So like canalization, manipulation, etc. This is all the early grounds in this sociological work. Even before the age of 12, girls and boys typically recognize that they look different, like that their bodies look different and she says that the reason that men associate this feeling of inferior like superiority with their organs and for girls it's this feeling of inferiority is because men go to the bathroom standing upright and like fathers usually make a point of showing their boys how men do it and that it's different from women and it's this like association of I'm standing and I'm more in control than you so I'm better than you to quote he does not experience pride spontaneously in his little indolent sex organ but he feels it through the attitude of those around him. So it's not that it biologically makes him superior, it's that the attitudes of those around him treat him as if he is superior because of it. Beauvoir talks about King Louis XIII's nurses and how history has recorded that they used to treat it with respect basically and treat it as a separate person. And so talking about the reproductive organs, we get to another key idea, the fact that a boy projects, well not, not like a fact but like a psychoanalytical fact that a boy projects his behavior onto his organ and because a girl does not have one, she treats her doll like one. Like Ballant in the psychoanalysis of the nursery, Beauvoir believes that this organ is like the alter ego of the boy, so it is simultaneously him and not quite him. And the female castration complex is often talked about in psychoanalysis to say like, oh, women feel that they are inferior because they feel as if they are castrated. But here the situation is that Beauvoir argues that a lot of girls react differently and some are envious because they think that it's more practical, others don't care. But Beauvoir argues that even if a girl does not directly envy it, as psychoanalysts suppose her to envy this, her brother who has like a little plaything that he can physically touch, she says that it is an that it is an important thing that plays a role in her life. Because the boy can partially alienate himself in his alter ego. It's a part of him that is both like inside and outside him, projects the mystery of the body and its dangers outside himself, which permits him to keep them at a distance. And he feels less scared of it because it's not directly inside him, whereas for the girl it's a whole different situation. 
And during puberty and this period of growing up when we're rather uncertain about our bodies and the changes that take over them, we sometimes worry about what's going on. And so Beauvoir argues that for the boy, it's not so much a problem because it's like outside him so he can partially separate himself from the changes but for the girl it's inside her and the girls often find herself concerned with like the changes and not only because of the whole oh i will grow a life inside myself like during pregnancy but because all of these changes she feels them and even her organs are changing but they're changing like more within her rather than outside and so she has her doll her doll acts as her alter ego because it's separated from her body simply because she cannot bear to have an ego inside her body and what Beauvoir has to say about the doll. It represents the whole body and, on the other hand, is a passive thing. As such, the little girl will be encouraged to alienate herself in her person as a whole and to consider it an inert given. While the boy seeks himself in his penis as an autonomous subject, the little girl pampers her doll and dresses her as she dreams of being dressed and pampered. Inversely, she thinks of herself as a marvelous doll. And, of course, we have this verbal appellation that we talk to girls and to boys differently because we socialize them into the roles that they have and have you ever noticed that when we raise kids and we see a girl with her doll or maybe a boy with some toy we usually treat that toy as a real life person because they see it that way so for the girl it's reinforced that oh your doll is so pretty and oh you look so pretty and it's reinforced this idea that she should care about her appearance and so what Beauvoir argues is that she says that this is how narcissism manifests because for the girl this doll is her alter ego and so having people constantly comment on the doll's appearance on her appearance it teaches her the values that she should care about her appearance and so she becomes concerned with putting on her mother's shoes, putting on her mother's makeup. And it's that sort of narcissism that comes from people constantly talking about appearance to the point where you care about it, not because of an inherent fascination with yourself, as we sometimes attribute to the mysterious feminine instinct. Oh, she's a girl, so of course she cares about her appearance. And this part is also important because of what Beauvoir calls weaning. So like the moment when adults start treating their child independently and sort of saying like, oh, you know, sleep by yourself, don't sleep with us, like as a, as a sort of adult, basically. And for boys and girls, it this moment comes differently. For boys, it comes earlier, but it's okay because boys are taught that they're more superior as Beauvoir argues so they don't see the separation as harsher it starts earlier but they have this admiration so it's fine and so for the boy it's okay because he can turn within himself like his parts to see how his body is changing also maybe project it onto a toy and again it's it's fine because his parents still treat him as someone who's like free so he enjoys the independence too but for a girl when she's treated like this she tr she can only turn to her doll rather than herself because it's harder to like explore her body in Beauvoir's statement. So uh, instead, this narcissism starts to manifest. And I know I'm like summarizing everything really simply here, but it's a 600 page book. So I hope what I said was clear. Just two main points. The male reproductive organ is an alter ego. And for the girl that like that alter ego is her doll. And so she turns to it. And that's why girls tend to be more narcissistic, Beauvoir argues. And obviously childhood is a large part. So Beauvoir has lots of key messages here. And one of them is that if girls were raised to be as vibrant and exuberant and energetic as the boys, they would be so. Because she argues that when this independence starts, boys are actively encouraged to go out and to climb trees and to like show their muscles, right? Because their body is a point of focus. But girls are still treated in a way that's like, oh, she's a girl, she's more tender. So their attention is still there. And the girl also sees that her doll gets attention just for being pretty. So she also starts to focus in on herself and to sort of like be more focused on keeping up with her appearance and being more like calm and tender and attract attention that way rather than through building muscles and getting the negative attention that a tomboy gets. And Beauvoir also specifically talks about the difference in how the sexes are raised. The issue is the less girls use their freedom to explore, the less opportunities they will have later on because then that freedom doesn't come. And Beauvoir talks about how a mother treats her son and her daughter differently. So for example, the son, she, yes, of course she treats him the same way, but she also 
respects the fact that he's a male and that he's different and so she sort of lets him like get away with more but for a girl she knows the values that a girl is expected to have and so she strives to integrate her into the feminine world the daughter like and the mom of course they love each other and that now there are more opportunities for girls to go and to pursue an education and to be athletic but Bavar also points out that she must at least also be a woman she must not lose her femininity so even though it's expected now that girls can go ahead and do all those things that boys do, she is judged far less for not succeeding. Bavar also talks about how girls and boys are given different responsibilities around the house, so her mother knows that it will be expected of the girl to cook and to clean for her husband, so from a very young age she tells her like do the dishes, wash the floor, do this, do that, and this even though it would seem, uh, even though it helps women mature faster in that regard, it also also takes away the freedom and the childhood and the opportunity to like see what you want to do to have those little moments of joy so either because of convenience or hostility the mother gives the responsibility and so the girl becomes a woman before her time the overburdened child can prematurely be a slave condemned to a joyless existence and the reason that mothers often give their girls their daughters more chores is not only because of convenience like oh finally i get a chance to like do what i want to do what i never got to do after i was married but also because of hostility but war argues that women who overburden their children who make a slave out of their child are just not comfortable with the fact that their desires that their goals their aspirations were never realized they never wanted to be stuck in this like traditional expectations of femininity and passivity and just like trad wife you know but now they have have to be and so they sort of projected onto their child that if I suffered you have to too and also from an analytical perspective of feelings of inferiority Adler believes that because of the difference of girls staying inside and boys climbing trees it's this like high and low the feeling of inferiority and superiority because the boys are like higher up in the sky also perhaps just taller with natural height and we have all these myths of like heroes climbing a mountains oh he's so cool so the girl feels herself body and soul inferior and the war also explores the difference in not only how the sexes are raised but in how they treat their parents and for Beauvoir, the electric complex is not simply like a sexual desire as Freud said but it is a deep abdication of the subject who consents to be object in submission and adoration so the girl sees that she will one day become like her powerful mother who's so in control of the household who has breakfast under control who's washing the floor who's doing all of these things but she still sees that her father in the majority of the households is in control so she knows that she will never become like him even though he's like the ultimate boss but while a boy feels rivalry because it's the same sex and his father teaches him that way the girl teaches uh, the girl senses only admiration and so what ends up happening is that the girl has a deep love for men and she is more likely to be religious because god is like this male figure that she can admire but that she can never be like and so Beauvoir also argues that not only do girls have like this admiration for men and they're taught to expect men through stories like cinderella they're also told to wait for men to give them the love and that often means that they don't really take the opportunity to explore their bodies at a young age and to go through like sexual initiation in a way and so it there comes a sort of like feeling of disgust because they don't know what to expect and intercourse is seen as unclean and so they're really unable to talk about it and sometimes even to just like engage in the act meaningfully because they feel really uncomfortable because they weren't raised that way and Beauvoir argues that if we start having these conversations with both sexes then that will make the relationship more meaningful and just better because both partners will understand each other's desires and needs and in part one Beauvoir also argues that a lot of girls have like this fatalistic attitude to say like just very accepting attitude that boys will be better because of all of these socialization little bits like this feelings of inferiority that they bring an attitude of laziness and mediocrity into lives and that's why women don't achieve 
more that that women don't achieve what they could actually achieve is what she argues she also talks quite a bit about homosexual relationships specifically lesbian relationships she says that girls get into these relationships because they don't want to be in marriage they want to be more free but they see their female lover as an idol as someone to look up to they want to be assured but at the same time they want to be more passive it's that inherent contradiction and also girls who talk to other girls in a bad way who put down other girls are just they just feel disgust in their own body and so they want to make those words lose meaning and that's why they address other girls like that and it's the same feelings that come into self-harm that girls just decide oh my body is disgusting anyway so cutting it won't do any harm. When she wounds herself, the girl is defying her future lover. You will never inflict on me anything more horrible than I inflict on myself. Beauvoir says that even though some women have jobs and they have like things that they really love to do, they feel like they have to devote themselves completely to their husband, that marriage still is at the forefront of ideas, and so they end up just quitting it all and then never being fully happy because they stopped doing it for someone that they like loved, but they didn't realize that love could be something mutual where you have your own hobbies as well. And she says, as long as perfect economic equality is not realized in society, and as long as customs allow the woman to profit as wide and mistress from the privileges hold by certain men, the dream of passive success will be maintained in her and will hold back her own accomplishments. And there's also a focus on specifically sexual initiation and approaching the moment when you get married and when you when it's the honeymoon, the wedding night. And Beauvoir says that for men it's a smooth transition because they were taught before that they are at the center of it all, that they're the ones who are supposed to be dominating it, so they're the ones doing it now. But for women, because they don't quite know what to expect and then they, they know that they're the subject of passivity, but they don't know just how much passivity they need, they're scared that it will like hurt too much but they're also upset if it's not with enough passion because they are taught that they are to be taken by men as Beauvoir says and so if the man is too violent she is upset and hurt that it's not like this romantic experience that she wanted but if the man is too gentle then she thinks that she's disgusting that he doesn't really want to take her enough that he doesn't feel enough passion towards her and Beauvoir argues that because of this sometimes women are overly frigid because they're embarrassed of the act and sometimes women close their eyes because they also want to distance themselves from it and uh, they also would like to prolong the contact after it to sort of feel as if they are one with the person they're in a relationship with. And Beauvoir argues that masochism in relationships is the assumption of guilt. I am guilty due to the very fact that I am an object. So the woman feels guilty that she is giving herself, that this is like the disgusting act that she has been taught is taboo. And so she sort of prolongs the humiliation. The same thing as with self-harm, she feels disgust at her body, so she actively participates in punishing it. And Beauvoir argues that the less tabooed relationships are, the smoother the initiation, and the freer the girl feels with her partner, and the more the domination aspect of the male fades. If her lover is also young, a novice, shy, and then equal, the girl's defenses are not as strong, but her metamorphosis into a woman will also be less of a transformation. The final chapter in part one addresses homosexuality and there are opinions that are very different to what we think today. Firstly, she thinks some women turn to homosexuality if they are unattractive and so they want to be more masculine or to avoid being dominated by men. And women resent that they are treated as unequal and limited in what they can do during intercourse and so they turn to other women. And these kinds of relationships are more open. So homosexuality, she argues, is based on one situation and makes an argument that homosexual couples are not worse than straight couples. They are a response to social conditions. And that's part one. Part two is the longest part of the book, but it does build heavily on part one. Beauvoir's writing is very organic, it flows very smoothly, and so it would be quite hard to talk about part two without all the detail that I spent in part one. So hopefully my explanations will be more clear and precise and brief and you will understand them better now. So part two is titled Situation and it concerns itself with many different types of women. Socialites, old women, mothers, um, prostitutes, uh, women who have both male and female sexual organs. And so Beauvoir touches on how it is that society treats these women differently. And Beauvoir talks about the fact that even though there is more freedom now and marriage is more of an option, it is still 
in the words of Little Women, very much an economic proposition. It basically means that it's the only way for a woman to secure her place in the society, to be financially secure, to be socially secure, to not be talked about as the one who's still not married, like, you know, behind her back. And because a woman recognizes and understands this, Vavor argues that she wants to compensate for her husband, like, because she loves him and because she also feels like he's doing more for her than she is for him. And so what she does is she either turns to their relationships and decides to spice things up and that's when things are introduced into the relationship or she because she didn't want to do the relationship in that way she it was different from what she expected because of what i talked about earlier she becomes frigid and so she feels that because she's not doing her part in the like romantic relationships of the marriage she should turn to housework and so she utterly devotes herself to housework to the point where it's just too much she's clearly overcompensating and let's see what Bavar has to say about that it is through housework that the wife comes to make her nest her own this is why even if she has help she insists on doing things herself at least by watching over controlling and criticizing she endeavors to make her servants' results her own by administrating her home she achieves her social justification her job is also to oversee the food clothing and care and Bavar says that housekeeping can also be a form of pain and punishment because the whole day is transformed into just waiting, waiting for the water to boil so you can make dinner, waiting for the laundry to finish so you can hang the laundry up, waiting to finish one task so that you can move on to the next, to the point where housework makes you lose your choix de vivre. <laughs> it makes you stop like enjoying life because your life becomes focused purely on housework and because of these tasks, because of these waiting, even like it can be so organized, it can be you doing everything the whole day, but it still feels like passivity. And we've seen why that's important earlier on with the doll. And Beauvoir also references Sophia Tolstoy to show how people overcompensate because as much as her husband was creative, she was uncreative and not because she wanted to be but because she was so occupied with him she was constantly rewriting his manuscripts like on and on and on and you know how grateful he was at the end he just replaced her with his own daughter when she couldn't do it anymore and in this chapter Beauvoir doesn't only rely on psychoanalysis or fiction she takes quite a lot of excerpts from like literature of the time she also relies on actual quantitative statistics again sociology students will appreciate the qualitative and quantitative analysis present in this book and so she has all sorts of evidence to reply to people saying that oh marriage is more free now women have more choice actually she says the wife situation is harder now because she still had the same duties while these no longer confer the same rights she has the same chores without the rewards or honor from doing them in other words it's more like thankless and final words on marriage before moving on to motherhood she says men who declare themselves anti-feminist with the excuse that women are already annoying enough as it is are not very logical. It is precisely because marriage makes them praying mantises, bloodsuckers, and poison that marriage has to be changed and as a consequence the feminine condition in general. Woman weighs so heavily on man because she is forbidden to rely on herself. He will free himself by freeing her, that is, by giving her something to do in this world. In this chapter about motherhood, there are some more claims that are a little bit um, outdated, a little bit not something that you would say in modern times, but that is expected of course given how far away this was when Beauvoir was writing it. And she says essentially that some women become lesbians because of abortion, because they're traumatized and they don't want another child. And she also says that pregnancy heavily depends on your mental state. And while the latter part is true, she sort of makes it as the sole focus and links it to marriage like oh she feels unhappy because of marriage so she miscarries and it's just not as simple as that and the main focus though is on how motherhood continues to restrict and to limit women in her opinion and she also talks about abortion which i think is very interesting to see how this laid the past to the thought that well most most feminists or most people concerned with equality have now abortion should be considered legal. She says that backyard abortions are first of all dangerous because the person who is doing them 
is unskilled. They're dangerous both to the child that you claim to care about and to the mother. And she says that if we if we make abortion illegal, it brings more miserable child into the children into the world. It must be pointed out that the same society, so determined to defend the rights of the fetus, shows no interest in children after they are born. And she points out, and I do think this has actually like a rightful critique, that most of the times when people talk about the fate of the children, they talk only about abortion and about prosecuting the people who commit it. But they don't actually talk about what we're doing with the children that we have now, the orphanages, how we can reform orphanages to be a better place for the children going through them for care, etc. For the mechanisms that we have in place to support the children. And she also points out that maybe we should focus more on contraception because in less economically developed countries, a woman has no choice because every time she has intercourse, she doesn't have the contraception so she like can get pregnant. And so essentially women have more children than they can support and that leads to more like, children death than, than necessary. And what Bavor says is, no one is disturbed because painful and absurd childbirth has killed maternal sentiments. If this is morality, well, what kind of morality is this? It's not only a question of people fighting for the rights of the fetus. It's also a question, she argues, of people not recognizing that it is inside the woman's body and so it belongs to the woman because they just can't see anything as belonging to the woman because they were socialized into believing differently. And she points further the hypocrisy of this belief that, oh, when a child is inside a woman, it's everyone's responsibility, but when the child is born, suddenly it's only the parents who need to be concerned with it. She also stresses that abortion is different for bourgeoisie women and for poorer women, because she argues that bourgeoisie women are ultimately more like liberated in the fact that they are more independent because they have that financial security, and so their expectations are different, they're not cumbered by morality that is expected from them. More financially secure women see it as a choice that will impact them because ultimately it is the woman giving birth, it is the woman who has to carry it through. But poor women are intimidated by a morality that maintains its prestige in their eyes. So they have to follow this like belief that this is immoral. And men universally forbid abortion, but they accept it individually as a convenient solution. She points out that it's just it's just not it to encourage someone else to not do something when you're the one doing it yourself. And Beauvoir also believes that the subject's infantile dreams and her adolescent anxieties are revived during pregnancy. So everyone experiences pregnancy differently, not only because of the difference in bodies, but because of their childhood experiences. So like if from childhood they had this feeling like, oh my god, pregnancy is going to completely ruin me, I am, I'm going to die, like the child is going to break me, then this anxiety manifests in the way that they treat their child, the way that they feed their child, both subconsciously and consciously, and the way that they treat their child after the child is born. And Beauvoir also stresses that there are two key differences in the way that people treat pregnancy. So first of all, some women see it as fulfilling and some women like genuinely want to have a child. And so she says like, of course, like if you want to have a child, it's your choice. It's all about choice. Feminism is all about choice. Like go ahead, have your child. The problem is women who think that they will be fulfilling their destiny. Because a lot of the time what happens is that they project their desires, their sort of wishes and aspirations onto their child. They think, okay, so, you know, I don't really feel happy because I quit my job for like this guy that I like. And so it's okay because now I'm having children and my life will be put together again. And this is wrong on simply so many levels, not only moral, like because you're having a child, not because you like it, but because you just th like doing it for yourself, you think that it will help you in some way. And the, the issues, of course it won't because they like put so much of a focus on their pregnancy that when they have the child, they're not pregnant anymore. So what do they do with their lives? And the mother is every time the boy accomplishes something, she's jealous because she didn't accomplish it. And anytime the girl accomplishes anything, she's treating it with spite because this could have been her when she was younger. So it's just not a healthy way to approach like motherhood and this next part also focuses on stereotypes it's not supposed to be like this ultimate guide to women but nevertheless 
this is this part does draw heavily on stereotypes and generalizations and saying that like oh you know the psychoanalyst said that this woman is like this so all women are like this so if you're reading this work and admiring this i do think that you have to look at it critically and to acknowledge its problems but let's talk about the stereotypes so it's about how women care about their clothes and all women want to be concerned with their opinion with like their appearance and that they can't have genuine connections so Beauvoir argues that because of women choosing marriage as a financial proposition they want to show to the rest of the world that they're doing well that they got married and they're living the dream and so what ends up happening is they start buying these symbols of wealth and prosperity so all these rich clothes first of all it's to accentuate their appearance to show that they're doing well because that's what's expected and second of all is to say look at me i'm doing great and what ends up happening <clears throat> is that women in marriage, even though they seem to be happy, is they don't genuinely make human connections. They become friends with people just for the sake of being friends with them, for saying that they know them. And it's the same with appearance. It, they become so hyper-focused on showing that they're, that they're pretty because if they're not desirable, what's even the point? That this is all that they start to care about. And they also lose like those inner values, those inner things that they hold meaningful to them before. And Beauvoir also talked about this whole idea that women can't have genuine friendships with other women. She says that they can they absolutely can because it's only other women who will understand them who will understand their financial positions those who are married but and this is something i talked about in the first half that Beauvoir argued that actually the reason that women don't rebel against their condition is because they like lo love their husbands right well not only because they were socialized to but because they genuinely do and so there's this sense of loyalty and even then they don't really tell their female friends everything and she also says that even even though they can be friends, they can never be fully friends because of this. And because Beauvoir believes that they often have like the sense of rivalry because they were told that getting a guy is like the ultimate goal. So then another girl who's also pretty is competition. And obviously, like I can't even stress how harmful this mentality is that you can't be friends with literally any other girl because they're competition. And I think this is also a very good essay topic on ways that you think the book is relevant and fresh and ways that you think it's like outdated in its thinking because of the knowledge that we have now sociological psychological psychoanalytical all of those regards and Beauvoir also offers an interesting take to in regards to prostitutes as she calls them or like sex workers she says that it's a response to marriage problems and that this is evidence that the marriage institution needs to be reformed both for men and for women so she argues that men turn to these women to like spice things up because they feel confined in their married life because they were raised like you have to be free you have to do whatever you want women do this because they think that it affords them financial freedom and in a lot of cases that is the situation that they just can't do anything else and if they actively chose that career that's great but it comes with weight with mental weight with feeling like you're a failure like you're not accomplishing anything and so Beauvoir says that it's absolutely economics an economic situation and women who find themselves doing this they are deluding themselves if they think that they're happy because the issue is that they just get tangled from one financial trap to another and it's important to mention that for Beauvoir success and like inner fulfillment when you like contribute to society when you do something new when you do what you wanted to do for her this is not really a success because you're just selling your body out and like contributing to this idea that girls are all about appearance for her and in this part she also talks about age because of course age plays a very important role in how like older women are treated by society so she says that actually an like old age can bring a sense of liberation because you're less concerned about your appearance since you're not desirable anymore anyway so what's the point so you can finally do whatever you wanted but of course like menopause it's this feeling like yes i'm old i can't do my function anymore and also like that women feel this pressure as they age if i don't have children now i can't have children later or if they have children at like 40 onwards oh you're giving your child a risk of having a disease so she talks about these sort of 
of pressures. So age brings a whole new set of pressures. But she also says that because older women realize that they can't really do anything anymore, that they won't have a new partner and they won't have a new shot at love because they think that they're undesirable, they often try to like live vicariously through other ways. Sometimes this is positive, sometimes this is not so positive. Again, the whole thing about projecting your desires onto other people. Moving on to part three and part four, justification and towards liberation. So here she talks about narcissism, love, and mysticism, these three elements. And Beauvoir argues that in love, it is the same that women are unhappy because they put their husband up onto a pedestal, that they sort of devote themselves to him so much, and they raise, they have these expectations that, oh, he's he's just like this god, and so when a man does something good, they're happy, but it's expected, and when he does something bad, they're devastated because it's a fall from grace, and yet when they're positing him as god, they they treat him as God, they revere him, and yet they also want to possess him. And this is an impossibility. They devote themselves so much that it's to the point where their like, whole entire life revolves around that person, where they spend time with them because of a sense of like admiration and marital duty, rather than actually liking them. And for Beauvoir, the solution is for both parts to equally see each other and to respect each other's freedom, to have that time to yourself and to spend time with each other because you genuinely want to, not because you're doing it, because it's just something that people do when they're married. And women want to feel special and needed a lot of the times. And Beauvoir says that that's great. She's not discouraging anyone from being just a tad bit narcissistic. It's just that if both partners want to do it and they give each other attention equally, then that's good. But if not, then it's a disbalance and that's that's ultimately not just a healthy relationship. The war concludes that even though progress has been made, it is because of social inequality that such problems persist still nowadays too. So she says that to to truly be free, women can only do so in a socialist society where they are actually treated as equal and it's not only about money and where they can pursue a job and education and a career while pursuing a family and they're not seen as any less feminine or as any like worse for workers than they, than they are. And she also urges us to be more open about talking about relationships with our children and with like how we talk about the differences between boys and girls to our children as well because it encourages a more open relationship and then that open relationship can address parental problems like treating your kids in a bad way better too. And she also says that she is after all happy that people are starting to discuss this and women are ceasing to become complicit in their like oppression, that women are going out and talking about this more and treating their bodies like more freely and that's better. And she also concludes that it's beneficial for the entire world if the sexes just stop fighting each other and try and subjugate each other and try and dominate each other and instead embrace both the differences and the similarities and treat each other in a more equal way because that will lead to just a better and happier society in general. All right, so with that positive message, thank you so much for watching. I hope the video helped and interested you. As usual, your your thoughts in the comments. Let's let's have a discussion. Thanks so much for watching and see you next week.